Hello, everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today, a Beatles video podcast in which we talk about everything and anything to do with the Beatles together and apart. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFEV Radio in New York City at 90.7 FM and WFEV.org. I've been uh, DJ at WFEV for the past 40 years. Um, and presently can be heard five days a week, Monday night through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And uh, Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. I actually had to think about that for a second. Um, and I'm with you here on things we said today. And it uh, is always a pleasure and something that I look forward to is spending an hour or two or three and sometimes more than that with uh, my good friend Ken Michaels. Uh, Ken's been in broadcasting a little longer than I have, but uh, and a lot of what Ken's done in radio has been Beatle-based programming, and that includes his current radio show, Every Little Thing, which is a syndicated show. Uh, and Ken, at the end, will tell you where you can go. Uh, <laughs> he'll tell you where you can go. Uh, he'll tell you where you can find out more about uh, every little thing and uh, where you can hear the show. In addition to that, Ken also has a YouTube channel, which as of a couple of weeks ago was called Ken Michaels Radio. But I think you're toying with changing the name. Uh, but, that might take a while. <laughs> OK, so we're still at Ken Michaels Radio on YouTube, which is a treasure trove of interviews and uh, about artists to go outside of the Beatle realm, not necessarily always within you know, the Beatles circles, Ken will go in other places with uh, on Ken Michaels radio. Ken also is the co-host of another podcast, Talk More Talk, which concentrates on the solo Beatles. Uh, and once again, always great, as I mentioned, to hang out with you here, Ken. How are you? I'm good, Darren. Uh, hi, Alan. And just to correct you, Dallin, I only tell you where to go. I don't tell my <laughs> <laughs> And and someone that uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the past, what is it now, five years, give or take uh, a dozen, uh, that I've been uh, on the show with Ken. It's Alan Cozen, an acclaimed writer, journalist, critic, author, a jack of all trades. These days, though, these years, the focus is on the McCartney legacy. Alan and Adrian Sinclair are in the process of writing the definitive uh, history of Paul McCartney. Uh, and his post Beatles years, volume number one was published uh, a little over, well over a year ago now, two years it's about. Mm -hmm. uh, the McCartney Legacy, volume one, 1969 to 73, which you see in the background there, that red uh, book, that's volume one. Volume two, which will be blue, is the McCartney Legacy, volume two, 1974 to 1980. That will be out on December 10th. And these books, just the latest in a series of books Alan has written through his career uh, on the Beatles, classical music. You've re read his work in the New York Times. Uh, he was an editor of the New York Times for many years and Wall Street Journal and highlights for children. And uh, it's always great to spend a little time with Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? I'm good, Darren. And hello, Ken. And hello, everyone. Else. And I want to take a second here to also send out Get will wishes to one of Alan's cats, Yoda, who is under the weather as we speak, as we record this on August 13th. Uh, and so when Yoda does get to hear this playing in the background, when he's back home from the kitty hospital, uh, get well soon, Yoda. Yes. And what's your other cat's name? Um, well, his full name is Boomerang, but we call him Boomer. Boomer. So Boomer's missing you, Yoda. So that's true. Anyway, so at this point in time, uh, we always turn to Ken, who has uh, the latest in Beatle news and Beatle related news. Ken, it's oh, all yours. Thank you, Darren. And by all means, invite Yoda onto the show. As soon as he's better. Okay? He's been he's had a walk through now and then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, the new box set for Mind Games as many of you know, includes hidden bonus tracks, or what we like to call Easter eggs, that were also available as a digital-only release. And now, two of them, I'm the Greatest and Rock and Roll People, are available for streaming. Universal Records is now saying that an additional two hidden tracks will be released 
every two weeks leading up to John's birthday, October the 9th. Speaking of streaming, George Harrison and Friends' historic concert for Bangladesh was made available for all streaming services last Friday. This includes all the music offered in the original album, not just Georgia songs, but those from Ravi Shankar, Ringo Starr, Billy Preston, Leon Russell, and Bob Dylan. It also includes as a bonus track the studio version of the song Bangladesh, released as a single at the time. As with the original concert, proceeds from purchasing or streaming will go to the George Harrison Fund for UNICEF. Now, uh, Cinema Nova is reporting, there have been lots of reports from various sources, that the film for One Hand Clapping will begin a limited theater run worldwide on September the 26th. Recorded over four days at Abbey Road Studios in August 1974, it's behind the scenes, it's a behind the scenes look at Paul and Wings with new band members Jimmy McCulloch and Jeff Britton rehearsing. This screening will also include an introduction by Paul recorded exclusively for a movie theater audience, as well as unseen Polaroids of the band. Originally shot on videotape, the footage has been scanned and restored in 4K. Now, the dialogue has been demixed using Wingnut's Mal Software, so that's Peter Jackson's team. And the film features a new Dolby Atmos uh, mix made by Giles Martin and Steve Orchard. Tickets will go on sale to see this in movie theaters August 16th for the event. That's this Friday they go on sale. Did this come as a surprise to the two of you? Sort of. You know, for Very all much we so. heard about the poor quality of the video, I guess they've done some kind of work to make it look better. You know, they say that, but they put out a little bit of uh, the band on the run clip uh, and they put out, um, what is it, was it Soily when the album came out? And it, it didn't look vastly better, either hmm. of those. I mean, did you think? No. <laughs> I'm just hoping that maybe in the theater it'll look, it'll look better, but uh, it, it surprises me if they didn't really improve the picture quality that much that they would even consider doing this. It surprised me, and I hate to talk. I hate to like. I didn't think there was enough of interest or a market to do something this on this grand of a scale with one hand clapping. Um, it's sort of. I don't know. I, I kind of view it. I've always viewed it as sort of something that the hardcore McCartney fan knows about and and has has eaten up. Is that enough to to put it in theaters? Even though even though it's a limited run, very limited. But I was very pleasantly surprised. But I was very surprised uh, that this is going to theaters. Honestly, I would have preferred it. And maybe it still will come to a Blu-ray player near near you. Uh, but um, hey. Beggars can't be choosy. I'll be in the theater wherever, wherever it's screening near me, and um, but it did surprise me. I didn't. I just didn't think there was enough. I would never have thought it being something that would have warranted this sort of um, visibility exposure. Mm -hmm. It's surprising that Paul has gone all out in this regard yeah. for, for the release earlier a few months ago. A one hand clapping the audio and now this um i do hope there'll be a dvd and blu-ray release yeah. too but um you know i'll be happy if it's in movie theaters for a day and it has some kind of decent showing um and hopefully mccartney fans are aware of this all right you may have noticed it on television new tv ads for uber in which the beatles recording of i want to hold your hand is used while well, other artists covering Beatles songs have become more commonplace these days in commercials, it isn't often that you hear an actual Beatles recording of one of their songs used. And in this case, it is. I want to hold your hand for Uber. At the same time, we do have a cover of the Beatles song Come Together, featured in TV ads for the Hard Rock and their Unity Loyalty program. The legendary blues musician, songwriter, and producer John Mayall died on July the 22nd. And just recently, Paul McCartney paid tribute to him on his website, saying that in the 60s, after spending time at late-night music clubs, 
The Beatles used to go back to his house where he played blues artists from his record collection. And Paul says he received an education from John playing artists like B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Albert King, and new recordings from a guitarist named Eric Clapton. Paul said, the more he played, the more I could see the links between all these great guitarists. Besides being very entertaining, it was a great education noticing the similarities between these stunning players. John was a lovely, down-to-earth man from the north of England, so he found it easy to relate to each other, and I will always thank him for his love of music, the blues, and his willingness to turn others on to what he knew. Some nice words there from Paul. Beatles author Keith Badman has reported that the forthcoming documentary on Brian Epstein, Midas Man, will be in theaters on October, October 10th, and that streaming information on platforms such as Netflix and Amazon Prime Video have yet to be announced. The first five albums from Paul McCartney's solo career are being released in Japan as limited edition SHM CDs. Those from McCartney, Ram, Wildlife, Red Rose Speedway, and Band on the Run will be released September 20th. These exports come with paper sleeves and with unique packaging featuring original uh, LP replica sleeves with original finishes and artwork. Lastly, the releases come with a miniature of a Japanese obi strap for the collector that has to have everything. Uh, Ringo Starr's Peace and Love Sculpture made from a casting of Ringo's right hand, will be on display at Niagara Park's Botanical Gardens in the near future. And the agency will be extending an invitation to the person behind the sculpture to dedicate the monument. Uh, the monument is part of a global project involving the Ringo Starr Foundation and uh, the 84-year-old musician's Peace and Love Initiative and International Peace Garden Foundation. A few reminders, Paul McCartney's photo exhibit of his pictures from late 1963 and early 1964 for the Beatles called Eyes of the Storm will end its run this Sunday, August 18th, at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, Ringo Starr and his all-star band resumes touring on September 7th in San Diego. And Paul McCartney's Got Back Tour resumes in Uruguay on October 1st. And just today, a new date was added for his tour. That's in Costa Rica on november the 5th and julian lennon is releasing a single that is a remix of one of his songs called i should have known which first mm. appeared on his album photograph smile the remix was done by spike stent and that is coming out august 23rd just a few more items here every year since john lennon's death the group theater within has put on a john lennon tribute concert usually close to the anniversary of his death and they will continue the tradition this year with a show on December 7th at Symphony Space in New York City. And this time, Kenny Loggins will be among the artists performing for the concert with more performers to be announced. Brian Ray, guitarist in Paul McCartney's band, has just released a new album called My Town, which includes six singles he's al already released, uh, plus four new ones, including the new single called When the Earth Was Round. And we have to take note of a passing here, Mitzi McCall, who, along with husband Charlie Brill, formed a comedy team that actually performed on The Ed Sullivan Show on the night the Beatles debuted there. Mitzi McCall has died at the age of 91. She appeared on Rowan and Martin's Laughing and was a regular on the TV series Life Goes On and with her husband, uh, on Silk Stockings, that program. She also did a lot of voice work on animated TV shows. And uh, she has said, along with her husband, that night that they were on the Ed Sullivan Show it was really one of the worst things that ever happened to the team because everybody in the audience wanted to hear the Beatles. They didn't really care about them. And before the show, she and her husband went through the routine with Ed Sullivan and thought that it was too much geared towards an older audience and he asked them to change uh, the script a bit. So they had to do last minute changes. And they were doing this while hearing the Beatles perform with screaming teenagers and they couldn't concentrate. And they still went on anyway and did their act. And they didn't go over that well. So it was a nightmare for the two of them. But they were there wow. that night. Mitzi McCall, uh, like I said, she was 91. 
And on a happy note, happy birthday a few weeks late to uh, Danny Harrison. August 1st, he turned, believe it or not, 46. That's it for Beatle News. And rest in peace to John Mayo. Yes. I was, I'm a big John Mayo fan. Interviewed him at WFUV. It seems like a lifetime ago. It's a long time going back to the 90s. Yeah. I should try to figure out what album he was coming around. He was such a gentleman. And um, uh, I, I just remember we were talking. It was almost like we were on the radio. And um, and I felt he should have been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a long time ago. And he's just getting inducted now. Now. Not good. Yeah. We have a lot well, to work with him because if it wasn't for him, we may never have gotten the Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, there's that period, and I don't want to. This is a, a Beatles show. I don't want to get onto a John Mayall thing, but you know, you always think about Miles Davis and his ability to find talent, and the fact that you know people like John Coltrane and uh, just to name one that comes to mind immediately, Herbie Hancock, all of these uh, uh, Joe Zawinul, and all of these musicians that uh, that that Miles brought into his bands through the years. For a while, it was like that with the blues breakers. You figure that um, Eric Clapton was a blues breaker. Clapton leaves. He's replaced by Peter Green. Yeah. Peter Green leaves. He's replaced by Mick Taylor. Even in recent years, guys like Coco Montoya, he had the knack, John Mayall did, of finding talent uh, to work with. And um, and you mentioned Fleetwood Mac, the rhythm section, the, the core of Fleetwood Mac, John McVie and Mick Fleetwood, came out of the Blues Breakers. Um, although I don't think Mick Fleetwood was a member of the Blues Breakers all that long, but uh, still. So, hmm. John Mayall, rest in peace. Yes. Anyway, we have a very special show for you. We're going to be introducing special guests in seconds as we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' first film, A Hard Day's Night. All right. Well, here we are. We Three of us have become five. And uh, I want to welcome our very, very good dear friends uh, to join who are joining us for this uh, 60th anniversary anniversary show on the film a hard day's night uh you know al sussman mr mr beetle fan uh al sussman's um been recently retired from the fest for beetle fans <laughs> but uh he was a fixture at the fest for so many years should i say decades and a writer <laughs> contributing to beetle fan magazine and uh it's always great to have him here a former host of this program, things we said today. So, how are you, Al? Al, hi, says, hi, Darren, and and all. Uh, how are you all? Uh, we're pretty good. Thank you for taking a little time out, Al, to hang out with us. And then our very good friend Bruce Spicer at home in New Orleans, uh, one of the preeminent authorities on the Beatles, uh, has published uh, a couple of dozen books <laughs> on the Beatles. And the latest one, which Alan uh, is uh, modeling, is The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, and more. It's the one and only, and there is only one, Bruce Spicer. How are you, Bruce? Great to have you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's always fun talking Beatles with people who know what they're talking about. That. Oh, well, well, I, right. I, well oh, certainly yes. Al Sussman, if not the other three. Yes. But no, all, <laughs> yes. all you guys. <laughs> and, and, and of course, Al is one of the uh, good folks that contributes to Bruce's books, especially the latest album books that Bruce has been publishing. Again, uh, the latest one called The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and more. So uh, here we are uh, talking about A Hard Day's Night. We just passed the 60th anniversary of the film's debut in New York. That was just a matter of days ago. We're recording this on August 13th. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the uh, the anniversary was this past weekend. So that would be probably the, 11. I think it was like the fourth or something like that uh, was the premiere. No, am I reading this right? Oh, this calendar is from what year? No, I'm <laughs> kidding. No, the 11th. The 11th, I think, was the date. It opened in, in the UK in July. Uh, it's been 60 years. Hard to believe all that time has gone by. 
So um, we thought have it would be... I, I have to come in and correct you. Oh, go right ahead. you're correct that the mm -hmm. film did premiere in New York on that day, but that was not the U.S. premiere of the film. It was just the New York premiere. Just the New York okay. premiere. Yes. Even though everybody cites it as the U.S. premiere, that the film actually had its first public screening in the United States on August 1, a Saturday morning at the Hollywood Theater. Now, I know your viewers are saying, of course, Hollywood, California. Uh-uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah. And the film also had a screening that same day in Columbus, Georgia. And the reason I know about these matinees is when I was researching the book, The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and more, I went through various newspapers and found newspaper stories written on August 2nd describing the screaming teenagers at the theaters for those two special morning showings. And then in those markets, the film that following Wednesday, August 5th, was put into regular screenings. Also on August 5th, other markets such as Atlanta in St. Louis, uh, there was a place in Pennsylvania that had it, Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, so the film got out there earlier and even parts of Louisiana had it. And one of the more exciting things for me that I found was a little town in Louisiana called Abbeville. And on August 8th, they ran an ad for Frank's Theater, and in it, it said, be one of the first in the state of Louisiana to see A Hard Day's Night. And it was called, I love this, an area world premiere, which is, it's either an area, you know, an area premiere or world premiere, but this was an area world premiere. But in parentheses, it said, ahead of New Orleans and New York City. So they were aware of the fact that they were getting the film, uh, you know, almost a week ahead of New York City. So I was right, though, with July for the UK. July 6th right? of the and UK then is correct. It was scattered over the beginning of August in the United States. Why uh, such obscure locations on the first of the month? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I think, you know, and they certainly weren't doing this to test market the film. They knew it was a hit because it had already played in the UK. So for whatever reason... They just decided maybe it was a question of, you know, getting all the prints ready and just felt, well, we have enough prints to launch it in certain markets a little bit earlier. And for the mass markets, it'll come out later, um, you know, a week later. Oddly enough, in Chicago, it didn't premiere in Chicago till toward the end of August at the Wood Theater. Um, mm -hmm. Very strange, you know, just a lot of weird things like that. But it, it's never as simple as it appears to be. And then when you do the research, you find out all sorts of little quirky facts. Mm -hmm. mm. And it's in interesting that you're finding out these facts now for this book, because in earlier years back, when like you were doing uh, some of your other books, these are, these are facts that maybe you didn't. There's always something that you, we can learn. Yes. Uh, even someone like you who's researching topics numerous times through the years, still coming up with, with things. Yeah, previously I'd approached it from the, the records and this time it was a more mm -hmm. thorough package of a hard day's night mm -hmm. so it was a question of you know let's get into the film and find out when it really did debut and i know from doing the book on magical mystery tour and yellow submarine both of those films it took a bit of research to find out when they debuted in the states so you know as part of my learning from the previous books i knew i needed to do the same for a hard day's night and it paid off mm -hmm. it was a fun surprise and needless to say, it was a box office smash from the very beginning across all markets. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it was very hard to find a negative review in the United States. In Canada, there were a few. But in the U.S., I mean, the, the biggest complaint would be that because of the screaming, they said it was like going to a silent movie. Sounds like a <laughs> contradiction. But the point was you couldn't hear the dialogue over the teenage yeah. girls. I mean, they only screamed when a beetle appeared on the screen in the theater. So, you know, think how often that was. But the reviews were, were great. I mean, you had the comparisons to the Marx Brothers, uh, the Keystone Cops. And a lot of the reviews would say the film was surprisingly good. And that mm -hmm. was a phrase that was in several reviews. Uh, the New York Times review started off with, this may surprise you, but mm -hmm. the Beatles film is a whale of a comedy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had things like that consistently, um, you know, that was the, the amazing thing about it. There just wasn't much in the way of 
of negative reviews, sort of like the Beatles' first press conference in New York City, where the New York press was just dying to tear these kids apart, and they ended up loving them. And the same thing with this film. The critics were just, you know, pen in hand, ready to, you know, tear away, tear away at the more, film, and yeah. they couldn't do it they, because they had to admit they really liked it. Mm -hmm. And and often they said, you know, I'm basically a square, but this film's really funny. It has a lot of energy. It's zany. Uh, Ringo was the one who consistently got the best reviews, and a lot of people were comparing him to Charlie Chaplin, saying that, you know, Ringo saying nothing was carrying more weight than, you know, most actors talking. So, you know, that was the, the consensus was Ringo definitely stole the show as far as the Beatles, although producer Walter Shenson made it clear that they wanted not to focus on one Beatle, but to make sure mm -hmm. each of the Beatles was given significant screen time. Um, how about some personal recollections? Uh, first with Al. Al, do you recall seeing the movie for the first time? Oh, absolutely. It was, um, now uh, Bruce and I had talked about this uh, uh, while during, you know, during the uh, the research for the, uh, for the book. And so, uh, so I think I saw it on a like either a Tuesday or a Wednesday afternoon during that first week after it it was it was the after its mass distribution uh, began and um, I got to the theater. Uh, this is at the the now long demolished Fox Theater in Hackensack, New Jersey, and uh, I got to the theater probably late morning and there was already a line all the way around the corner uh and it it moved very the line moved very very slowly and um and <laughs> the fact that it was a hot day didn't help um uh but it moved very slowly you know we crawled into the theater um by the time I got in, there were only seats in the balcony, and I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't been at the bout in the balcony in that theater since I used to go up there and spy on uh, teenagers, uh, you know, making out in the back in the fifties, and and the uh, this is these were the days of double features, and. <laughs> Some some brain surgeon decided, oh, okay. Well, if this is a Beatles movie, we'll uh, for the for the uh, for the opener, we'll put in an Elvis movie. And it was, it was either um, Girls, 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 or Follow That Dream. Um, you know, when, because when we talked about it, and I actually found the theater ad for that. Confirming ah, yeah. it was a double bill, but I think it was Follow That Dream was the one yeah. that was on the bill. But I remember uh, it was the same theater and, you know, in the same city, just as you said, at the Fox Theater. And there was mm -hmm. the ad. So it was fun to confirm your memory was actually very good on that, Al. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I when I got to my seat, there were probably five minutes left in the film. And when the credits came up the whole place booed <laughs> and uh and then you know then on comes the united artists logo in black and white and then that flash and the next thing you see is of course the beatles running up the up the street and i've never heard noise like that in a theater i you know, i never uh i never went to a beatles concert so that afternoon is probably the closest that I got to, you know, experiencing Beatlemania, and um, you know that 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 great uh, that great script by Alan Owen. I didn't hear any of it because it was <laughs> because a silent movie, huh? It, it was a silent movie, exactly. Uh, you know, I finally did uh, back. I guess in December, I saw it at, at another theater, and you know, which was half full. And so I was able to actually hear the hear the dialogue, but that uh, that first um, that first especially uh, you know the the whole scene in the uh, in the in the railroad station when when Paul McCartney 
puts down the newspaper and he's got the you know the fake beard and then mustache. I've never heard again. I've never heard noise like that. <laughs> so it was uh, it was it was pretty. It was an amazing experience. And how about you, Bruce? You remember that first uh, time? I remember first was um, before the film came out, I was at a movie at the Beacon Theater on Harrison Avenue, which I always thought of George Harrison whenever I went on Harrison Avenue. That's also where the record store I used to go to is right off of that. And they showed the preview. And what I remember most was Ringo doing his Sir Walter Raleigh imitation of putting the coat over the mud for the young lady who went down the manhole. Mm -hmm. And finding this is going to be a great film. I can't wait to see it. But I had to wait a lot longer because when the film came out, we were on a family vacation in New York City. And we were going to see the World's Fair and, you know, yeah. Funny Girl and, you know, Broadway shows. But uh, seeing the film A Hard Day's Night was not on my parents' to-do list in New York. <laughs> so uh, so I I missed it. And uh, the, and the ironic thing, of course, was it was the infamous, you know, Barbara Streisand on the theater that caused me to 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 miss that movie. And then when the Beatles were in New Orleans on September 16th, uh, it was my older sister's birthday and she was a big Barbara Streisand fan. So we didn't go to the concert. So so I didn't see the film until it came on TV. And, you know, and that's pretty strange. I mean, I'm sure it came back to New Orleans, you know, before then, but it wasn't like I was scouring the entertainment section when I was, you know, nine or 10 years old looking for when the movie would be back. <laughs> so sure. uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I didn't see it to TV. But the good news was I did understand it because, uh, you know, by then, I wouldn't say I was an expert on a Scouse accent, but I at least had a fighting chance to understand a British accent and I was watching it by myself in my house, and there weren't any screaming girls. So I, I really did get to hear the dialogue. Alan, do you recall? Um, you know, I don't really. I think my experience was probably something like Bruce's. Um, I don't think I saw it in the theater when it first came out, because um, so that summer I was 10, and I, I might have had a relapse into my Beethoven thing um, <laughs> briefly and well, maybe not so briefly. And uh, I think I also might not have seen it until it came on TV or if I saw it in the theater, it, I don't, it didn't make enough of an, the, the experience didn't make enough of an impression for me to remember. But I do know that when it did come on to on television, I had a mic up against the speaker <laughs> and recorded the soundtrack. And Ken, do you recall when you saw it for the first time? Was it on it television? Had, it must have been on television. Yeah. Like, no, Same I didn't me. see it in the theater. I did yeah. see Help in the movie theater when it first came out, but I didn't see. I saw Help before I ever saw A Hard Day's Night. Hmm. Yeah, and for me, it was, I mean, I wasn't born when A Hard Day's Night opened. Um, and I was just a couple of months old for help. But a, yellow, uh, a Hard Day's Night Yellow Submarine, if I remember correctly, in New York City, would pop up on television. And it would mm -hmm. usually on Channel 5, if I remember, which then was WNEW, Metro Media Television. Right. Channel 5. Channel 5. Long before Fox TV, uh, because that was the Fox affiliate in New York City, Channel 5, now WNYW. Uh, but it must have been like a midnight or 1 a.m. in the morning screening on Channel 5. I know Yellow Submarine would pop up uh, more often than, than, the, than a hard day's night. Um, so back to 1964. Um, and something I was curious about, which really is getting a little... A little on off to the side uh, of the main, starting with the beginnings and the origin of the film and uh, how it was done, why it was done. Um, say it didn't happen. Say Brian Epstein didn't think it was a good idea. The band shot down the idea of making a film. The offer never came to the Beatles. Whatever the case might be, a hard day's night never happens. The Beatles don't make a film in 1964. How do you think it would have impacted, if at all, 
their rise, the Beatlemania spread throughout North America and the world in 64. Do you think it would have had an impact? Would it have slowed down Beatlemania or was it happening anyway, movie or no movie? Let's go back to that first part of a thing you said about what if the Beatles had turned it down. The Beatles actually did turn down their first film offer. Um, and John, uh, in the su early summer of 63, where they had had Please Please Me and From Me to You being really big hits, that uh, they apparently were given an offer. And John, in one of the magazines, I think it might have been Melanie Maker, said that we have been given an offer to appear in a film uh, with one of 20 different musical acts with, you know, no real plot or meaning. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we turned that down because we want to do a film that would hold the interest of teenagers and that it would do us more harm than good if we did such a film. And uh, the irony of that was the jukebox musical type film that he was talking about was a film that had come out the previous year that was called It's Trad Dad, Trad being short for traditional jazz. And this was a film, if you do the math, that had six jazz artists. It had six U.S. artists, you know, Gary U.S. Bonds, Chubby Checker, uh, Del Shannon, that type of stuff, and six British pop artists. If you add that up, that gets to 18. And, uh, you know, and well, you know, that just wasn't the type of film that John would have done. The interesting thing about it, though, was the director of its trad dad, which was called Ring-A-Ding Rhythm in the U.S., because trad didn't mean anything in the U.S., was a guy named Dick Lester. And I recommend for those of you who have not seen the film, uh, go ahead and, you know, Google it. You can probably watch it on uh, as Ring-A-Ding Rhythm on YouTube somewhere. And there are many, mm -hmm. many sequences of music performances that if you watch them, you'll go, oh, my God, Lester did something similar to that, only a little bit more skillfully in A Hard Day's Night. And also the, um, you know, surreal type things uh, and tricks like that. Close-up shots of the recording artists, pan shots, uh, cutaway shots, the whole group uh, thing. And then showing a TV monitor and pulling back and seeing the band in the studio. All kind of shots like that were used by Lester in its trad dad which shows he was the absolute perfect person to, uh, you know, to be the uh, person who was directing that film. And uh, Walter Schentz and his producer made a really good choice bringing in Lester to do that. So as far as your first thing, if they had turned it down. Now, the next part of your question, um, in the UK, I think when the Beatles did the Royal Command performance, they were sold in the UK, not only to youngsters, but also to adults. However, mm -hmm. let's look at what happened in the US. The Beatles do the Ed Sullivan show. 73 million people tune in. Yeah, what were the reviews? The reviews were horrendous. TV reviewers and critics tore the Beatles apart. And so the Beatles really didn't have that adult acceptance. You know, it's a fad, it'll be over with. Oh my God, it's terrible. But when A Hard Day's Night came out, you know, these reviewers who were waiting to lambast the film couldn't do it. You know, a funny thing happened. The film was funny. And so for that reason, it gave them that adult experience, uh, you know, and acceptance. Sure, Beatlemania by then had happened. And not doing the film, Beatlemania would have continued, but they would not have had that more mainstream acceptance in the U.S. but for the film. Right, right. Conversely, uh, if there had been no film, it was it, it, their success was was a runaway train at that point. I um, mean, a hard day's night. The single was their fifth number one record, their fifth number one single in basically five months. That's a lot of number one records yeah. to have hit. In a of course, very there wouldn't have been a hard day's night single had there been no well, yes, but I mean, if but there would have been, been something else. That the single, the, the single du jour, right? Exactly. Hmm. Interesting. All right. For a different perspective, we throw things over to Alan Cozen for a question or two. Alan, the floor is yours. I see. <laughs> okay. I I kind of think um you know to pick up on 
on the end of your last question, um, and to see what 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 Bruce and Alan and, and uh, you and Ken think about this. Um, while I, I do agree that Beatlemania was sort of already, uh, in a way, unstoppable by the summer of 1964. I mean, and they were mm -hmm. touring, and uh, you know the the sort of the mania was all over the place, and they were in newspapers and magazines still. But I think that um, to go back to something that we talked about a little earlier, which was that Bruce made the connection between Hard Day's Night and that first press conference at, at Kennedy Airport. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in terms of the audience, uh, whether young or old, getting some sense of who these guys are, uh, Hard Day's Night probably was really crucial and it was mm. crucial like for it to come out at that time because it was still the kind of the first flush of Beatlemania and, uh, you know, people wanted to know what, what, what more is, is there to it than what we saw on the Sullivan show. And uh, does that seem logical to you, Bruce? Right. They, they fleshed oh. out. Yeah. The images, you know, because previously, you know, at least to like the the the, the mainstream audience, the adult audience, as, as Bruce mentioned, um, you know, there were just these four guys with uh, with long hair. But the film kind of fleshed out their individual uh, images, images that John Lennon, of course, later on pretty much repudiated. But uh, but still, they were the you know they were kind of the the images that most people had of them for at least during the you know the the Beatlemania years. Mm -hmm. It also opened up a new audience and career for them uh, if they wanted to pursue it more because mm -hmm. you know they were musicians and now all of a sudden you know they were comedians mm -hmm. and some of the reviewers were saying you know, that the Beatles have this bright future. Even if you don't like the music, you have to appreciate them as comedians. And I think there were a lot of adults that were kind of hoping they would be the next Marx Brothers and would every year come out with, a, you know, a great film. As it turned out, uh, you know, they did A Hard Day's Night and Help, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, nothing else really for a while, certainly nothing like those two films. There never was another Help, Hard Day's Night. Uh, you know, those were the you know only two they ever did. But if they mm -hmm. had gone in that direction, um, you know, I mean, on help, they had a, uh, you know, a really good screenwriter, the same person who did charade. So it wasn't like they, um, you know, were, were a one and done type thing or a two and done. They could have done a series of films like the Marx Brothers if they had wanted to go in that direction. And I suspect that they would have given us a couple of more great comedies had they wanted to. Possibly, although even once they got to help, John was saying they were extras in their own film. And, you know, good as help was, they were sort of over it in a way. They were, but, Where, you know, whereas Hard Day's Night was like it served a purpose for them. And they and I think they they enjoyed it much more, too. Um, I mean, I agree with that, Alan. But what if what if Brian told him, look, boys, you know, Let's face it, you know, we're not going to do a talent for loving because that's a Western. We're going to do some more comedies and we got this, you know, great film. I'm going to have you and Peter Sellers in it. Then maybe, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do another comedy if Peter mm -hmm. Sellers is in it. Sure. We don't know. We do know they gave us two great comedies. <laughs> One of the great things about the Beatles was that they didn't repeat themselves. No. So they made five films and they're all so completely different from each other. But I think, you know, pretty much what you were saying, Al, one of the most important things about A Hard Day's Night was that it helped to establish their personalities, which became cemented in our brains after that, you know, and you didn't really mm -hmm. get much of a chance before A Hard Day's Night to hear them talk too much. So I right. hear the music all the time on the radio. Mm -hmm. you know, and You were lucky if you got to see them say anything in a press conference. So here they were and... And like you were saying, Bruce, um, they wanted to make sure that each of the four Beatles had a lot of time on camera. Yeah. 
And the so, interesting thing, you know, you talk about the personalities, and of course, when the Beatles cartoon show came around, uh, the people doing that picked the personalities as they interpreted it from a hard day's night, mm -hmm. and boom, gave them, you know, those TV personalities, that, which were a little bit different than a hard day's night, but you could see what the inspiration was. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about um, John's repudiation of of the screenplay. Um, you know, having seen A Hard Day's Night eight gazillion times over the past 60 years and having heard, you know, a, a great many of their interviews that they did all over the years and seeing them in action doing various things, to me... Alan Owen's script is not that far from the mark, but, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, with some artistic liberties, which you're going to have no matter what, it, it wasn't a documentary, although it looked kind of like a documentary in a way, but how far do you guys feel Alan Owen really strayed from the essence? Was it, was John just being overcritical or did he have a point? Bruce? And I really think he hit the mark in a lot of ways. And the Beatles were also on set with him so that there were mm -hmm. times when they would be going over the script for the day and would say, look, you know, that's not really what we would have said. We would have said something more like this. And he would be making changes to the script. That was not the case in Help. Help was we have a script, we'll do it and get it done. Mm -hmm. In this film, there were changes. One of the big changes for the better by the Beatles was the scene where, uh, you know, in the baggage car where Paul's grandfather has been kind of in prison for being such a bad guy to say he was getting married. And the original way the scene was, is they're going to be talking to him about something. And, and he says, oh, yeah, well, what do you boys do? And, oh, we do songs. And they play a song. And the Beatles were like, well, that doesn't seem very natural. You know, mm -hmm. we're sitting around here. We'd be playing cards. Oh, OK, great. We'll have you playing cards and then it'll dissolve until you all playing music. So I think the Beatles had that kind of creative input. And with Dick Lester and his love of the surreal, of course, that was perfect to where you could have guys playing cards and all of a sudden they're playing instruments. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I think because there was that interaction with Alan Owen on the scene, I think it, you know, made it a lot more uh, accurate as to what it would have been like. I mean, you know, you look at the press conference as we were talking about and, that's pretty much the same. You look at the scenes on the train and the Maisel Brothers documentary, and mm -hmm. a lot of that's the same. So, Absolutely. you know, I think he was pretty damn close to the mark. Uh, you know, I mean, help was obviously a lot more fantasy, um, you know, but I think A Hard Day's Night hit it pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. The uh, The personalities were you know, slightly, I, I suppose, slightly stereotyped you know, witty John, cute Paul, laconic, but wry George, and uh, put upon Ringo. I suppose. I suppose the the uh, the stereotype of Ringo was the one that was probably least um, realistic, because um, it and and of course the image in the Beatles cartoons also didn't help that because that it took that kind of not very bright put upon image and exaggerated it. And of course, but, Ringo is nothing like that. But Al, they did show him in a pub and that became one of his problems later on. This is true. <laughs> very true. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, the, the great thing about it too was because it was a low budget film, there was never any consideration to shoot it in color because in those days, color was a lot more expensive. And, you know, as I always tell people, thank God Ted Turner never got his, you know, little mm -hmm. colorization hands on it. I can't imagine that film in color. And I think that it works so much better in black and white. Documentaries in those days were always in black and white because they were low budget. Mm -hmm. And it did have that wonderful documentary feel to it. And I think that was an important you know, part of the film. I think also it was good to to add, you know, a, a foil in the film of Paul's grandfather. 
kind of like in the Marx Brothers, you needed Margaret Dumont. And mm -hmm. in this film needed uh, a character like that. And having, you know, Wilfred Brown Bell in it was a stroke of genius. And, and of course, you know, as a kid, I didn't catch the in-joke, but, you know, but it'd be people would say he's very clean. And what I learned later, of course, was that he was in Steptoe and Son, where he played a dirty old man. It'd be kind of like Red Fox being in a movie uh, from, you know, Stanford and Stun and saying, oh, yeah, he's very clean. You know, <laughs> we, of course, right. we knew that wasn't the case. So the, the people in England had that running joke uh, on steroids, where for us it was just funny because it kept happening. Right. So, so Bruce, when you, when you were just saying um, about it being in black and white, that was done because it was low budget or because I, I've heard Walter Shenson say that was an artistic decision. Well, he may have felt it was an artistic decision, but I guarantee you if he had gone to UA and said, let's do it in color, they would have told mm -hmm. him no. So I think it's fair to say that in Shenson's mind, he wanted it to have a documentary feel and shoot in black and white. But at the boys in New York at United Artists, it was going to be a black and white film because they weren't going to pay for color. Hmm. And they wanted to get this film out as quickly as possible because yeah. they they were pretty much convinced that, you know, this was going to be a six month uh, phenomenon. And then, oh. you know, there'd be no, you know, no use for uh, uh, for the film after that. I mean, let, let's talk about, you know, how the film got to be made to begin with, which is really kind of crazy because United Artists in the 1950s, um, you know, was a very successful independent film company. And they wanted to have a music division because they saw the synergies uh, where they could be putting out film soundtracks rather than somebody else. And so they were looking actually to buy out uh you know, Liberty Records, uh, but they couldn't afford to do so. So they said, well, we'll start our own record division, our own music publishing division. And it was somebody in the London office. And in the timing of this is interesting because in September of 63, the Beatles by then had had, you know, please, please me, from me to you and she loves you. So they had three mega hits. Um, but one of their employees in the music division over in London thought, well, you know, this is a freight train that's really going. But what if the Beatles caught on, you know, in America where they really aren't known? And if we got a Beatles movie and in our contract got the rights to a soundtrack album, then United Artists Records in America with that soundtrack could make money. And if the Beatles made it big, that even if the film was a failure, well, we'd make money on the record. And that's the way it was explained to Walter Shenson when he was brought in on the project was, look, what we lose on the film, we'll make on the record. Let's just get it out quickly. And the crazy thing about it was that Walter Shenson took the project seriously. You know, he brought in Dick Lester. They had a good script. And when you read about what he was saying in the British music weeklies, uh, you know, it sounds like a bunch of PR, but I think he sincerely meant what he was saying. He said, look, this is going to be the kind of film that the Beatles want to make, and it's the kind of film that you want them to make, and it's the kind of film we want to make, meaning me, not so much necessarily New York, but that he and Dick Lester wanted to make. He also said there would be no concessions for American audiences. He and Lester were American, and they knew America was a target market for the big bucks on it. But, you know, they were going to have their Liverpool accents. And if you didn't understand every word, that was OK. And what he said was the film is going to surprise you with the Beatles talent. He really believed in their talent. And when he saw the early rushes of the film, he praised Dick Lester, saying, you know, the train scene was the first one shot. And he said that. You know, the, the way it was shot was very imaginative, great camera angles, great cutting. And I'm real excited about the rushes. And the Beatles are showing tremendous talent. So, you know, he was very enthusiastic about the project. And, of course, the funny thing was the film was a big success. It was uh, the top 10 grossing film in America uh, that year, going up against some very popular musicals. 
And the other interesting thing he said, United Artists rushed out the soundtrack album at the end of June, even though the film wasn't coming out to mid-August. Why did they do that? Because Capitol Records, although they couldn't put out a soundtrack album, had the rights to the Beatles recordings. And they got wind that Capitol was going to issue a couple of singles and put out a semi-soundtrack album. So they rushed out their album. That's why I'll Cry Instead is on it, because they thought at that time in late June that I'll Cry Instead was going to be in the film. And so they rush out their album and it quickly sells one, two million copies. And now Capitol's playing catch up. So it was a brilliant decision, you know, by United Artists to do it. And Shenson said, you know, based on the sales of the album in one week's time, we could burn the film and the project would have made money. Fortunately, they mm -hmm. did not burn the film. <laughs> you know, putting it out in, mm -hmm. in June also had the effect of by the time people could go see the film, not that they were apparently listening, but right. they would have known all the songs already. They, mm -hmm. you know, yes. it, it, it would have been, uh, it would have made it in a way more of an event, I think, you know, going to hear all these songs that you know. I mean, in addition to like, Do She Loves You at the end, everyone knew that pretty well by mm -hmm. then. But now they knew all the new stuff too. So that was actually a, a smart move, apart from the predatory move against capital. And the other thing, too, is, you mm -hmm. know, when a year from now we talk about help, it's kind of the opposite, where the film and the soundtrack come out about the same time, so that for many people going to the theater, they had probably heard the help single, but all the other songs would have been new to them. Whereas here, as Alan's rightfully pointed out, you know, they knew all the songs. And so, of course, when the Beatles start the very first notes, if I should have known better, boy, those girls are screaming their lungs off because it's such a great song. It was the B-side to A Hard Day's Night. It was on the soundtrack album. Wasn't on something new, but clearly everyone in that theater had heard I should have known better multiple times. And all they needed was those first few notes to start screaming their lungs out. Yeah. So, Ken. Ken? Yeah, I wanted to ask... Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, when the movie came out, I remember reading that it peaked at something like number seven on the charts in the box office charts. And I would have thought that since the Beatles dominated the record market, the singles and their albums, it could have been number one or close to number one. Although I also know from all the years, Al, you and I have worked together, mm -hmm. really Andrew's time. In 1964 and 65 with Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music and all that. So right. I could understand the popularity of those albums. But why didn't the album chart higher, in your opinion? The album chart. I mean, the, oh. I'm sorry. The, the <laughs> Yeah, the album, the was, album yeah. went for 14 weeks. Yep. Yeah. I mean, well, let's look at uh, the film. <laughs> you look, look at what United Artist alone had. And then you can talk about some of the others. Goldfinger was the number three grossing film from Russia with Love, number five. A Shot in the Dark with Peter Sellers, number six. The Pink Panther, number nine. A Hard Day's Night, number 10. And then you think of some of the other films that you had. Mary Poppins, My Fair Lady. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you get the idea mm -hmm. that there were a lot of really, you know, big films that appealed to adults at that time, whereas A Hard Day's Night was not the adult market film, although adults that did go to see it either forced to to take their younger children or because they just were curious, it did well. But uh, they had a lot of competition. So finishing number 10 uh, is really not bad at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it grossed a respectable, uh, you know, $5.8 million. That's not bad for those days. Okay. I'm just wondering, so used to the Beatles being number one at everything else, you know. Well, let me put it this way. Out of some of those films, not all of those films have made more money than it make the top 100 films like A Hard Day's Night has for many, many years. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Bring up the use of surrealism, as you said before, because it's something that's so unique to this film. I remember the first time watching it, and after the train scene, the Beatles are running outside the train trying to catch it, and I'm saying... Right can't happen <laughs> yeah uh, and all yeah, these can we have our ball back yeah 
<laughs> John disappearing in the bathtub. Uh, the, the... No, that really happened. John went down the drain. You didn't know that? Yeah. He had to shoot it three times. Poor John going through that little drain was really hard. Yeah. You know, I saw in your book, I didn't know before um, I was, was reading that, that Roy Orbison was actually there when they filmed that scene. That's kind of a and, nice and he was saying, scene. you know, I mean, he was cracking up on the set. And for that, he was saying to, Amer you know, Americans, you've got to see this film. You're going to love it. Mm -hmm. and, and that must have meant a lot to the Beatles. The other thing, too, was that one of the reporters, uh, I think it was a guy who wrote for both one of the weeklies and also uh, the Beatles book. He used different names depending on who he was writing for. And what he said was that, uh, you know, the Beatles really wanted to make this a great film in that they knew when they could goof off and they knew when they had to be serious. The other thing about the film was they hated the fact that they had to get up early in the morning and they didn't like the fact that they had to wait for everything to get set up, for the lights to get ready, for all these other things to happen before they could actually start filming. But after about a week, they began to get more and more into the routine of it. And they also found it exhausting. At the end of the day, they were exhausted. You know, not just the scenes where they were running around, but any of them. And of course, the famous opening scene, uh, they had to shoot it twice because the first time they shot it, George fell down and got back mm -hmm. up and kept running. So they said, well, we better reshoot it. And then when they looked at the rushes, they were like, no, that's perfect. Let's keep it. Mm -hmm. But uh, they shot it twice for that reason. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the classic scene of Ringo you know, along the, the, the river's edge and, oh. and all. Uh, he was, uh, he's all, has said all these years that he was totally hung over because he had been out at a, at a nightclub the night before. So, you know, so that gives you an idea that they, you know, that they had their problems with, uh, you know, the, the, the discipline of, of movie making. Hmm. It got to a new level. Uh, to a new high, shall we say, for health, yeah. which we'll discuss <laughs> next year. <laughs> but why, why in particular the use of surrealism? To make well, I mean, it I like think it's... part of it, too, I'm sure the Beatles were attracted to that, but Lester used it in its trad dad, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. he has a scene where the, the narrator moves the characters, uh, you know, from their hometown to a BBC studio and then tells them they need to go to a nightclub and he moves them, um, you know, in a surreal way, uh, you know, to um, a nightclub. So I think Dick Lester liked the surreal aspects of it. And I think that was probably Lester's influence. And, and John, of course, would have loved the idea as well. So mm -hmm. it, it was a perfect fit. I think they had a lot of respect for uh, Dick Lester, certainly. And, uh, you know, Walter Shenson may have been the suit on the set telling him, you know, put that cigarette out. This is going to be shown to kids and stuff like that. Um, but Shenson uh, truly appreciated the Beatles' abilities and talent and really promoted it and sold it to the New York office. Uh, um, I remember interviewing him informally. Uh, I was at a Beatles convention in uh, Virginia Beach, and um, his wife had recently died. He was there by himself, and me and a few other people befriended him, and we had every meal together for three days and some great stories. And I was telling him that my favorite sequence in the film was this brilliant one of And I Love Her, where, you know, you have the use of the monitors, you have the close-ups, you have the wide shots, you have the scene where you're in the booth and all of a sudden you're on the floor of a studio, you know, TV studio and the whole bit. And I said, and what I really love is that pan shot of Paul, where Paul gets in shadow and then the camera hits the light and you don't see anything, and then it comes back to Paul in shadow. And he said, yes, that was brilliant. He said, when we sent that to New York, they said, well, you'll have to fix that. And he had to tell them, no, 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 no. We're <laughs> leaving that the way it is, because they didn't like the idea, you know, that looks like a mistake. And he was like, no, that's intentional. We're keeping it. So, you know, I mean, it was really the perfect group of people, and of course, a screenwriter. So you really had the right group of people to put this film together that showed the wisdom of John saying, you know, we're going to write, wait for the right film. Well, they certainly, you know, did get that right film in, in every aspect. 
And we should mention Victor Spinetti as well. Mm. Oh yeah, was <laughs> absolutely perfect as the uh, you know the the neurotic uh, TV director. Yeah, I mean the film pokes fun at a lot of people. It pokes fun mm -hmm. at TV directors, obviously. It pokes fun of stodgy adults that think you know that they're more important than you said. So you know you know uh, yeah, Mister, you know it's his train that whole bit. And also, you know, people at press conferences and the kind of questions you're asked, it pokes fun at a lot of people. And most importantly, it pokes fun at the fans of the Beatles and the Beatles themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that was one of the things people liked about it. They found the Beatles coming across as is charming that, you know, they don't you know, they didn't take anything seriously in the film and they certainly didn't take themselves seriously in the film. And I think that really endeared a lot of the adult reviewers uh, realizing that. And, you know, I think that really helped. So, I mean, it's one of those films where I would not have changed single frame. You know, I can't think of what I would have done differently, except maybe made the concert scene at the end a little bit longer and had uh, you can't do that in there. Mm. But short of that, I don't know what I'd have done differently. Would you have retained the cut Paul scene? I'd never seen it. So right. it's kind we, of hard for me to say having yeah, read we it, only know the, it, the vaguest outline of, you know, the, the, it to uh, me, it sounded like it would have slowed down the pace. And I think they probably mm -hmm. did the right thing, taking it out. Possibly, but it leaves him as the only one who doesn't have any kind of a solo moment, even though he John's doesn't, pretty sure. Well, but he has, but he has that interaction with his grandfather and Paul comes across, even though he's scolding his grandfather you know, he's taking his grandfather on this to begin with, and he seems to have empathy for his grandfather. Interesting. So I think Paul has that interaction that the others don't have. So I think that makes up for the cutscene. Okay. And as we've seen, and as we've seen over the years, Paul's acting ability uh ranges from A to B. <laughs> it's about it's about it. He's 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 not a thespian, let's put it that way. He seems to be the one most self-conscious in front of a camera. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's a consummate yeah. PR person. So yeah, he's going to be conscious mm -hmm. there's a camera there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring up um, certain camera shots that I found to be really interesting. Of course, there's the classic one when the Beatles are running on the field during mm -hmm. Camp Ivy Love and you see them suspended in the air, jumping in the air. I mean, was that done before? Well, Lester it's did... Uh, yeah, you know, a little feature right. short where he used that same type of concept. So he's just recycling mm -hmm. things and the camera angles. Um, you know, when you see uh, it's Trad Dad, it's Trad Dad ends with a jazz concert. And although it's not as frenzied as the Hard Day's Night Scala Theater scene, it still has the quick cuts, the close ups of the, you know, faces. Although in this case, it also had a close up of a, a woman's rear end dancing along. So, you know, Lester, Lester liked those types of things. And, um, you know, I urge people who haven't seen it's trad dad or ring -a rhythm, go see it and keep in mind. Oh yeah. He used that in a hard day's night. It's full of it there. That's really where he cut his teeth. Hmm. And the running jumping film. Yeah. As well. And nobody had really done that before him. I'm not saying it hadn't been done before, but mm -hmm. I don't think anyone had done it as well as he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I there's a scene, there's yeah. a concert scene in its trad dad with a group called the Brooks Brothers, or like the British version of the Everly Brothers. And during the song they're singing, you know, they're establishing shots, they're close-ups of their faces and things like that. And then you also notice in the background, there are photographs of the Brooks Brothers. Just like on the Scala Theater, there are photographs of the Beatles behind the Beatles performing. So there are a lot of things like that and a lot of surreal things. There's a scene, and not just with the interaction with the narrator, but the little sight gags where um, the two, Helen Shapiro and Craig Douglas, who are the two teenagers, are trying to find uh, Alan Freeman, a BBC disc jockey. And they see this door that says music department. You know, well, maybe he's in there. And they open the door, and it's a, it's a bunch of shelves with musicians lying horizontally on the shelves with their instruments. And then it you know, shuts the door. So there are a lot of those little surreal type things and sight gags that Lester used in that film that, of course, he uses uh, uh, in A Hard Day's Night. 
making me really want to check out that film, Bruce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was going to say also the scene, the Can't Buy Me Love scene, before they're out on the field and they're going down the fire escape, and you see the camera underneath the stairs of the feet. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so unique. You know, I don't think I remember seeing anything like that before. Well, his camera angles were brilliant, and you know they were brilliant in his trad dad. You know, I mean, he really had a good feel for it, and it was like Walter Shenson just from the rushes of the first day of shooting that train scene. You know, was all excited about it. You know, the fresh way he had shot things. You know, just different camera angles, the excitement, the quick cuts. Everything was different than what you were used to seeing. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough. They had the perfect team to do that film. And, of course, the Beatles. The Beatles were so lucky. You know, we, we said it time and time again, not only to have each other, but to have George Martin produce them, to have Brian Epstein mm -hmm. produce them, and then... Walter Shenson's their producer. He worked with Richard Lester. He brings Richard Lester on board. They get Alan Owen. They have all the right pieces, you know. It's just amazing. <laughs> um, I also wanted to bring up um, the aspect of it being fast paced. You know, every scene is a short scene. So it really keeps your eye on the screen. And um, it keeps everything seems so fresh for that for that reason. Apart from the fact that the music's great and the Beatles' personalities are great, but everything is quick, quick, quick. And then I think that had a lot. I think it influenced a lot of what followed later on, like I brought up in television shows like Laughing, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a very important element in a hard day's night. Oh, absolutely! You know, it was very influential. It didn't just, you know be the father of, uh, you know, the videos, MTV and all that other stuff with music videos. And the monkeys. Um, yeah, obviously the monkeys. The interesting thing, and I, I keep harping on its trad dad, but even the London Times, you know, the Times of London gave it a good review because of the fact of the imaginative shots of Lester's direction in saying that the musical performances were really exciting the way they were filmed. You know, and he used things where he would shoot down on like the Temperance 7 with a shot above them shooting down and things like that. So, as I've said, once again, a lot of the tricks you see in A Hard Day's Night, they're there and it's trad dad. Hmm. OK. Uh, Darren, back to you. Yes. Uh, what? Let's talk about the Beatles relationship with um, the other actors in the film. Uh, and maybe concentrate on the, I guess you could say the four main actors, um, Wilford Bram Bramble, Norman Rossington, John Junkin, we mentioned briefly Victor Spinetti already. Um, they were all, especially uh, Wilford Bramble was an established British actor. Um, I think the others were as well. I don't know uh, their backgrounds as, as, as well. Um, these other uh, individuals coming into this type of film, um, was there as it, as any hesitancy on their part? And then once the work started on the film, what was their relationship with the Beatles? Pick any one of the names I just mentioned. Uh, I know on Wilford Brambell, but they, they certainly knew who he was, obviously. And um, I don't know so much the Beatles, but I know when I interviewed Patty Boyd a year ago at the Fest for Beatle fans and asked her about him. Uh, he just kind of felt, and she felt he was more kind of a little bit uh, standoffish in the sense of that, you know, I'm this respectable British actor that's, you know, this is a paycheck for me was kind of the way that, you know, it was. And it may not have been that way at all. That was just, you know, someone's kind of impression of him that he wasn't, you know, as open with the uh, other cast members as some of the others. But Norman Ro uh, Rossington and John Junkin really played their roles perfectly and m meshed very well with the Beatles on screen. How about um, in your research through the years, how about their relationship off screen? Has there been any um, any information that you found out about uh, their working relationship when the cameras weren't rolling? Well, Norman Rossington in particular uh, did a fair amount of, uh, of work, uh, TV work, 
uh, with with John Lennon on British TV. And also, it's a strange uh, little trivia uh, nugget, is that Norman Rossington is the only actor who ever appeared in, who was, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, who's ever appeared in both a Beatles film and an Elvis Presley film because he was in the absolutely dreadful, um, and now the title is gone. Um, uh, there's a an Elvis film from uh, from uh, since from '67. Saying and dreadful Elvis film could narrows it to about ten. This is true, <laughs> at, at least ten. But the title is gone. This is what happens, you know. So, <laughs> but anyway, Norman Rossington was in that Elvis film as well as A Hard Day's Night. Was uh, the uh, one of the girls at the Cirque Club was also had the role of Dink and Goldfinger. So you've got an actress yes. who was in both a Beatles film and a James Bond film. And right. for many Double people's trouble. opinion, the best mm. Bond film and the best Beatles film. Yes. Double Trouble is the Elvis film. I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. How long uh, after? How your home? memory had Double Trouble retrieving the name of that film. That's very true. <laughs> the actress, by the way, Bruce, is Margaret Nolan. Yes. yes, who just but to me, she's away, always not, dink. No. She's always dink to me. Right. <laughs> she within she passed away within the within the last year, I would say. No. Mm -hmm. Um, how long um after Hard Day's Night were was to to talk about help or 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 the second film, they didn't call it help from the get-go. How long, how much time between projects was there? found something, I think, in Cashbox in September of 64, talking about getting ready for the next film. And in a month or so later, they were even talking about the third film would be A Talent for Loving, a Western, which never happened. Yeah, I think it was the Beatles' fascination with Westerns, particularly Ringo, that made them think they wanted to do that. But I think when they read the script, they decided not, we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But they knew right away there would be a follow-up film and, and quickly. Right. I mean, I think the plan was, you know, they were going to do two albums a year and four singles a year. And, oh, let's add two, you know, a film a year to the uh, recipe as well. And for two years, that held. But that was it. Right. Jumping off topic tour from the movie to the album, um, when you were talking about how Capital uh, was beat to the punch by United Artists, put it, put, put out the uh, soundtrack uh, to A Hard Day's Night. Um, did Capital ever entertain the thoughts of scrapping something new? And when something new did finally come out, um, were they criticized at all for what to me today looking back seems to be like fleecing the Beatle fan in kind of releasing the same half album just a couple of months apart. Well, you know, mm. their original idea was that they were going to do pretty much the UK album. And if you think about it, they could have very easily done the UK album. The UK album is only 13 tracks. So one of the tracks, you can't do that, had been on the Beatles' second album. So they could have put out a 12-track album and done the exact same thing, except they would have moved Can't Buy Me Love to side two. And then that would have been their album. And they were thinking of doing that, but the problem was when the United Artists album came out, then all of a sudden they kind of changed their strategy. I think if they had been ready to go and those two albums came out at the same time, what are you going to buy? the official soundtrack with eight Beatles songs and four George Martin instrumentals, or the same album that has those same songs, plus, you know, six more Beatles songs, sign me up for that one. So if Capital had rushed their album out, um, I think that they would have been the ones at number one in United Artists, maybe at number two on the charts. Same, it was the opposite. So Capital, the title of the album showed how desperate they were, you know, something new when it really you know, had something old, something borrowed, you know, and has a little blue on the cover. So maybe something blue as well. Uh, and the other thing that I wonder about is that it did not have from side two of the UK album, I'll Be Back. 
And mm -hmm. I wonder if I'll be back originally was going to be on it. But around that time, our good friend Carol James at WWDC, who broke I Want to Hold Your Hand, he was also around that time spinning Come Gimme Diner Hond. And that was getting a lot of airplay. And I wonder if Capital said, well, rather than I'll be back, we'll put Come Give Me Down or Hond on it. And that'll be something really cool to give the fans and make it something new. So that's I have, have no documentation on that. That's just possibly that happened. Interesting. And in, and in fact, in September, uh, at the end of the of the Beatles first national U.S. tour, um, there were some radio stations, including WABC in New York, that um, that began playing briefly. Um, I'll be back uh, as a and uh, it, was the, it was the usual thing. Well, Ringo sent us this new song, which they you know, were simply taking from the, you know, the UK album. But uh, he, he sent us this song as a promise that they will be coming back. But it was interesting that they <laughs> that that much in the way that uh, that Carol James had played "Come Give Me Your Come, Come Give Me Your Dinah uh, that, uh, that there were stations playing playing "I'll Be Back" in um, in in September. Mm -hmm. it's funny that for those of us who grew up with the American albums, "I'll Be Back." seems to fit more on Beatles 65 than it does on, than it would have on something new. I don't know why it, it doesn't, it's historically wrong, but it just mm. seems to fit with those, those other songs. It has a slightly melancholy cast. Um, seems to, well, fit. you know, it's the weird thing about it. And we could do a whole show on what capital did and, and why they worked. Cause almost all of them do work really well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, Beatles 65, it's, it's a great album. You know, I'm working on the book now, um, you know, Beatles for Sale to Help. But, of course, that's going to include Beatles 65 and Beatles 6 mm -hmm. and the Help soundtrack. And uh, those albums work really well. Uh, you know, you for a guy who supposedly butchered the Beatles, you really did a good job overall. So it wasn't what the Beatles intended. Mm -hmm. But it's like I tell people, you know, that's how it was done in the 60s. You know, you look at the Stones. The Stones had Andrew Lou Goldham, who did mm -hmm. specifically U.S. and U.K. albums. Mm -hmm. I mean, he understood we got to put Not Fade Away on the album because hit singles make hit albums in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what Dexter did, when there was a Beatles album that he was pulling tracks from, he generally kept them in the same order as they were on the U.K. album. Could not have yeah. done that, obviously, for the Beatles' second album, but he certainly mm -hmm. did it for Meet the Beatles. Mm -hmm. You look at Beatles 65, Beatles 65 side one is the first six songs from Beatles for Sale side one. Right. And, there and you go. something. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Something, some, and something new is basically uh, the, the British Hard Day's Night album, just minus. Hard Day's Night, and I should have known better. And uh, and uh, I'll be back. And uh, and plus, come give me a Donna Hahn. Oh. So it's very very similar. I guess it's uh, all what you're used to, what you're brought up on. Oh, of course. The songs in that order. And right. I always loved "I'll Be Back" on Beatles for Sale, but it also makes sense for a song called "I'll Be Back" to be the very last song on an album. As if to say, mm -hmm. be back. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, so Alan, let's go uh, back to Alan and maybe one more uh, go through. Alan, Ken, uh, some some closing questions if you have or thoughts on Hard Day's Night. Yeah, you know, uh, since we since we've sort of segued into recordings, um, and also we're sort of. We've got your, you know, your book as the backdrop for um, a lot of this, which which also has, you know, two pieces by Al um, in it, historical and musical backdrops, which is really really good reading. Um, Thank you. And and also, I just want to point out, you know, how fantastically illustrated it is. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just beautifully done. Um, but. One of the things that comes through, um, since you're talking about record, I mean, you talk about the film too, but since you're talking about records, is that in addition to the 
sort of chaos of Parlophone versus Capital and United Artists now in the mix, we still have in this volume and at that time uh, the involvement of uh, VJ and Swan and uh, and you know people all these labels coming each other and but using each other using the tracks and it was really kind of interesting that uh, you know even though you you point out that for instance she loves you uh, even though it was released on Swan since Capital had the right to the Beatles recordings they could put it on the Beatles second album and so you know I don't think as as a kid I thought that much about label affiliations although we sort of thought of the Beatles as a capital group. Um, but, you know, looking at it now, it's completely chaotic. You know, you don't, you just don't see things like that anymore. Contracts are too ironclad. I mean, you know, it was fun because, you know, the last, after talking about the film, you know, it's like, okay, well, what was going on? And so VJ had till October 15th to get out all this product. So they put out, the Beatles singles they put out before on the oldies label, you know, and they rushed that out. Uh, you know, the songs are like, you know, a year old, so they're already golden oldies. <laughs> and then you also have the Beatles versus the Four Seasons LP. And, uh, you know, and the United Artists says, well, you know, the soundtrack album is selling well, but what if we put a banner on it, this Christmas banner, and tried to get people to, you know, buy it as Christmas presents for their children or their friends? So there was a lot of creative marketing going around with the limited amount of catalog that each of the different companies had. And it's it's fun talking about all that. Uh, you know, in the book, there was so much going on in the UK. It was, you know, a hard day's night for us. It was a hard day's night and more. And it was it was a really fun and colorful period. Seeing and by it, the way, I also wanted to give a shout out to Al's wonderful chapters in the book. And, you know, this is... Eight books in the series. The ninth one will be the last one. And I've had the same core people working with me on the book with Al, Frank Daniels, Pierce Hemmingson, and Bill King. And it's been remarkable to think that, you know, we're such good friends and get along so great that nine books, that same core people working together on a project is pretty unique. That says a lot about, you know, everybody involved in the project and, you know, so I certainly greatly appreciate that. And I need to give a, a salute. I've had the same graphic designer, Diana Thornton, since day mm -hmm. one on my first book. We've been working together for 27 years. As Alan points out how great everything looks, Diana's the one that makes that happen. I do these rough layouts and then say, make it beautiful, make it pop. And she never lets me down on it. It's just great to work with all those people. But are all, all those illustrations are your actual records? A lot of them are from my collection. And then others, some of the memorabilia things I'll get from uh, people like Jeff Osberger. Mm -hmm. I used to get images sometimes from Gary Hine, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Perry Cox, Rockaway Records, you know, Wayne Johnson, Gary Johnson. I think the, the great thing about the Beatles world is, you know, once people realize, okay, mm -hmm. Bruce is trying to compile and do all this stuff, you know, I've got something cool he might want to have for his books. People send me these great images and, you know, it makes my job a lot easier because I think that that Beatles community out there realizes that myself and Al and Frank, you know, we're all doing something special and they want to help it make it better and contribute to it. So I've been really very fortunate in the years I've done these books. Mm. Ken? Well, first of all, I just want to say that earlier you mentioned that A Hard Day's Night was in a double bill in a lot of theaters. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my wife about this because she saw Hard Day's Night when it first came out in D.C. And she said the other movie that they had up against A Hard Day's Night was a Phyllis Diller movie. <laughs> and I couldn't remember the title of it. But since you remember Double Trouble, you might be able to come up with it, Al. But... Uh, <laughs> You can imagine that the same people who were there to see A Hard Day's Night probably didn't care all that much for Phyllis Diller. Probably well, not. Um, there was a review. So, so what is the Beatles connection between the Beatles and Phyllis Diller? Uh, Phyllis Diller is funny and the Beatles are funny. I don't know. Their mm. hair is both crazy. Who knows? Richard uh, Buskin has written books about both of them. 
I think he ghosted Phyllis Diller's autobiography. And of mm. course, he's done a few Beatles books. So there's a mm. it's tenuous. It's tenuous, I realize. <laughs> yeah, they, they may not have known that at the drive in back then. But um, <laughs> the other thing, too, is that uh, there was a review from a, a smaller town in California where the guy absolutely loved the film. But he mentioned that uh, it was preceded by an Elvis film. And and the girls were just booing the entire time. Exactly. They wanted Elvis off the screen. And, you know, Elvis is dead. The Beatles, you know, are, are it. You know, cut that off. So I think these theater owners felt the obligation to give people their dollars worth as it was back then or dollar 25s worth. Mm. They would have been better off financially just showing the Beatles film. They didn't need to double bill a hard day's night with mm -hmm. anything. Mm. They could right. have showed it twice. Yeah. Little Bill, Hard Day's Night and Hard Day's Night. <laughs> Back then, you know, you know, more than once. Yeah. And some yeah. of the fan recollections I got were people that sat through it multiple times, and two, yeah. including one girl who was young at the time who said that her father finally went in the theater and grabbed her and got her out of there. <laughs> and then some guy who, you know, told his parents, I'm going to see the film. And he's, you know, he saw like a one o'clock showing and he didn't come home to like about 10 at night. And they were all worried about where he had been, of course, and were mad at him, uh, you know, for giving them that scare. But he just watched the films <laughs> of the theater shut down. Mm -hmm. And Jude Kessler's uh, reminiscence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jude's story, where her father, that's the cute thing about that. They're watching the film and she says, you know, another fan recollection in the book and her father's mumbling something about Marx Brothers and Keystone Cops. And he had called, you know, the Beatles were no talent and John Lennon's a hoodlum and how can you watch, you know, anything with him? And then after that, but he was the one who said, do you want to go to the movie? And then when it was over, he turned to her and he said, you want to see it again? Apparently he enjoyed it too. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, you know, um, I just wanted to bring up a, a couple of things because we had, we mentioned Margaret Nolan, who was both <laughs> um, the girl who was Goldfinger. She was painted gold, yeah. Goldfinger. And no, she wasn't. She was not. No, Dink that was, was not painted. Dink was, was by the pool for Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was painted gold there. Yeah, that, but not in the film itself. Yeah, yeah, right. But there's other James Bond connections with A Hard Day's Night. One of which is that the instrumental version of This Boy, the George Martin. Oh Marcus yes, has mm -hmm. Vic Flick as the guitarist, yeah. and he's the same guitarist who played the James Bond theme. Yeah. Right. Wow. So Richard Vernon, who was in the car with the Beatles on the train, was also in Goldfinger, the older man on the train with the Beatles. And um, the Cirque Club, where uh, Paul's grandfather went to play, uh, went gambling. Back, back around. Yeah. Um, they used that same scene, the same background in uh, Dr. No. Mm. Bond, Bond, James Bond. Yeah. Yes. Now there, there are a lot of little wonderful connections between the Beatles and Bond. I mean, their first release is coming out on the same day in the UK. And, mm -hmm. and I think it also was when we in the United States were being exposed to this British culture, the two things that slammed you over the head were the Beatles and Bond, both beginning with the letter B, by the way. Mm hmm. <laughs> Like See, Bruce does. People who have right, like Bruce. Right Bruce head. is a right. letter B too. That's <laughs> correct. Well, Al and Bruce, thank you so much for taking some time uh, to hang out with us and talk about Hard Day's Night, yeah. sixty years after the fact, uh, and uh, mark it down in your uh, calendars that in a year we're going to do a help show. I'm sure, and we're going to have the two of you right back here for the sixtieth anniversary of Help. Uh, but uh, I get, once again, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you, Al, and, and to see mm -hmm. you, Bruce. I'm looking forward to seeing you, uh, if not before that, at the Fest for Beatle Fans 2025 in Jersey City in mm -hmm. late March. Um, uh, Bruce's latest book is called The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and More. And Alan's yes, got it there. The cover. And you can get it from my website, which is very easy to remember. Just Beatle, you know, B-E-A-T-L-E dot net. That net. That's right. Exactly. And thank you for making such an easy 
uh, website to remember. It has aided me many times over the years because I remember, oh, Bruce is Beatlesingular.net. But uh, so the new book, The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and more. And Al contributes to the book. Thank you guys for your time. And we will see you next time. Well, as always, if I may say so myself, that was a lot of fun. And it's always great to have Al, who we don't get to see as much now that he has stepped away from the Fest for Beatles fans and retired from uh, being a fixture at the Beatle fan conventions, the Fest, uh, and Bruce Spizer, of course. I still have to catch up. I'm behind on his books. I got to get some of his more recent books. So um, great to have Bruce Spizer on and Al Sussman. As we look back 60 years to A Hard Day's Night, the film here on Things We Said Today. So it's time uh, it's time to get in our booty pajamas now and, and go to bed. Ken's got the booty pajamas with the trap door in the back. And it's almost that time to go away for the night. But before we say goodbye, let's go around the horn uh, and, and uh, give everyone the information we want you to have ken it's all yours okay first of all let me start with my website kenmichaelsradio.com where you can find beatles trivia as a feature all the time and there's always 10 prizes to pick from if you know the answer among the new prizes that i have to give away is the new gary berba uh, book called reunion a rock and roll fairy tale and it does tell the story of imagining if John Lennon was still alive. He never was murdered in 1980. It's 1998. Linda McCartney passes away. And Paul comes up with the idea, actually through his daughters, to do a tribute concert for Linda. And he asked the other Beatles to perform with him and do a reunion. And they agree to do it. This is the story behind that. So we have this book to give away from Gary Burr, who you know from all of his work with Ringo and a long career as a very successful songwriter, especially in country music. And I also have this new book from Aaron Badgley, who we're hoping to have on, on this show, Dark Horse Records, the story behind George Harrison's post-Beatles record label. So you can win those books just by playing along with Beatles trivia. Okay, go to KenMichaelsRadio.com for that. My other talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next show that we'll be doing should be next Monday. And we're going to do a show on everything's all around me. And how did you know I was wearing my pajamas? <laughs> anyway, Revival 69. This is the new DVD that just came out about the live piece in Toronto concert with performances, not only from John and Yoko and Pl the Plastic Ono Band, but a lot of iconic 50s rock and rollers. Also, Alice Cooper is in there. And How uh, much? I didn't get mine yet. How much Chicago is in there? I know Danny Seraphine. Doesn't he? Uh, there, there are interview segments with Danny Seraphine. I haven't watched it yet. You haven't watched it, okay. And I, I haven't I haven't ordered mine yet. I'm getting ready because we probably will do a show on this yeah, as well. Right. We mm -hmm. that. So I know the doors are mentioned, but they were never filmed. You know right. that? Yeah, um, I think I knew that. What a why was that? Why didn't they bother doing that? Anyway, so we're gonna do a show on that DVD that's coming up this coming Monday, um, which is the 19th of August. And uh, if you want to listen to my weekly Beatles radio show, my syndicated show called Every Little Thing, the best way to do that is by going to WFDU's website, which is WFDU.FM. They run the show every single week um, and they leave the show in their archives each show for two weeks. So if you go to their archives page and you type in Every Little Thing, you'll get the last two shows that aired on the station. That's mm. the easiest way. Okay? Or else you can go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, look up the page, every little thing. It has all the radio stations that run them and their times with links to their websites so you can stream them. Okay? And uh, I do believe that's everything. Oh, no. Ken Michaels Radio, the YouTube channel. And uh, let's see. I had uh, a recent interview with... Uh, Madeline Baccaro talking about uh, mind games and Yoko's influence at the time on John and on that album. And also Chip Manninger, who was a guest on our show just now uh, when we were talking about the mind games box set. And he lists his favorite tracks 
from the new box set between all those different mixes. That's on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. So if you can, please subscribe. And uh, back to you, Darren. Hi. And uh, in your world, Alan? Okay. Um, you can reach me on Facebook at uh, either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And there is also a McCartney Legacy Facebook page uh where we you know if we hear about for instance um amazon having a sale on uh, on pre-orders of volume two we always put that information there and also on x uh so keep an eye on those and uh, you can save some cash um you can write to all of us here at things we said today radio show at gmail.com um lately so people have been sending in show ideas and thanks keep that up we uh, may eventually get to some of them or maybe all of them um but we have to sort of talk about them amongst ourselves uh but you can also follow us on x at things we at things we said fab and there is our facebook page Things We Said Today video podcast with a symbol like this up on top. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that's it. All right. And uh, and that logo, if you hold that up again, Alan, uh, the new Facebook page is going, is uh, we'd like it to be the go-to place on Facebook. And our old page will be getting closed down. I am going to delete it on September 1st, if I've been posting like mad on the old page, um, which is things we said today. What is the full name of the, the old page? Radio fans or something. All right. <laughs> if you go, if you, if you did a search on uh, Facebook and uh, you'll find a couple of things we said today, uh, pages, the video podcast page with that logo that Alan just showed you is the one now and you'll find another one that has my madness all over it closing september 1st we're going to shut down please join us at our new page i mean that please go to the new page do not get disconnected because um mainly because i confuse easily and all these pages drive me nuts and i got a clean house and get rid of the old and we'll have the new so please join us at our new page anyway uh for me listen to me on fuv wfuv um, I actually would like it better if we were located on the West Coast because I think KFUV sounds better. But we're WFUV in New York City, and you could hear me. Well, yeah, if we were, you know, out West. <laughs> These are the things I think of when I can't fall asleep at night. You know, we could be. Anyway, you can hear me uh, 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday night, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., uh, spinning uh, FUV's unique mix of new music and alternative music, some old favorites sprinkled in. Uh, you can catch me Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. And if you're not in the New York City tri-state area listening at 90.7 FM, stream WFUV at WFUV.org or get our app. And you can listen to us on our app. And uh, I think very quick mention on Thursday, August 22nd. So we're talking next week, uh, Thursday night, a week from this coming Thursday, I will be at uh, Jacob Burns Film Center uh, for the second time this summer in Pleasantville, New York. Uh, first time out was hosting the screening of the recent Zombies documentary. And on uh, the 22nd, August, Thursday, August 22nd, it'll be a screening of the Jonathan Demi film, the Talking Heads concert film, Stop Making Sense. And uh, so that'll be happening 7 o'clock. Go to BurnsFilmCenter.org, I believe, is their website. Um, so that's it for Ken Michaels, for Alan Coase, and I'm Darren DeVivo. I want to thank you so much for spending time with us. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Things We Said Today, and we will be back in a couple of weeks with a new show, and we hope to see you then. Take care.